Hi, Dr. Bruning. It's such a pleasure to have you here today speaking with us on such a very important topic such as anxiety. And I know you just wrote a book on that recently called Tame Your Anxiety, Rewiring Your Brain for Happiness. And just a little bit of background about who you are. You are the founder of the Inner Mammal Institute and author of several books. You're also Professor Amaretta at California State University, East Bay. And you also write a blog called Your Neurochemical Self, Getting Real with a 200 million year old brain on psychologytoday.com. Is that correct? Yes, thanks okay. for having me. Of course, it's our pleasure. So I read your book and I absolutely loved it. As someone who suffered from anxiety since they were about 11, I remember my first panic attack back then. I had no clue what it was. I don't even think my mom knew what it was. I was. I remember trying to describe it to her, and um, it was just awful. And we were both clueless about it, so we just, you know, she told me to have a cup of tea, and we just moved on. But um, I loved your book, especially because it gave a lot of the, like, biology behind anxiety attacks. And I think a lot of people don't really understand, like, the chemical reactions that take place in our body when when this happens so that part of your book was especially very interesting so if you um just want to give us a brief summary of what your book is is focused about then we could start hitting the ground with some of the questions okay first i i want to say you brought up such a fascinating thing with your mother saying have a cup of tea because <laughs> although part of me identifies with like um finding fault with how we were raised. Uh -huh. But the other part of me says, yes, having a cup of tea. That's what I do. That's what people have always done. That's the answer, you know. So we'll talk about it from, from both directions. So um, in my work, I focus on the job that our brain evolved to do. And it's very fascinating to understand that your brain is not designed to make you feel good and to make you happy all the time. It's designed to promote survival, and it evolved in a world of tremendous threat where um, harsh realities had to be constantly um, managed, uh -huh. and our brain releases happy chemicals when you take action to manage these difficult challenges. Uh -huh. So in a world where you're um, relatively safe and protected, all that machinery that evolved to fight famine and pestilence is now activated when you, let's say, don't get invited to a party. Yes. <laughs> and the way this happens is, um, I mean, just very simply, you'd call it learning. So we all learn what is a threat and what is a reward. Each brain is born unwired and learns from experience. And it doesn't learn from experience consciously, it learns because happy chemicals are like paving on your neural pathways. Unhappy chemicals are like paving on your neural pathways. So whatever happens to you builds a pathway that says, this is the way to meet your needs and avoid threats. And then each brain runs on the pathways it has until it builds new ones. So, so anxiety, um, do you believe that we have uh, like a genetic propensity towards you know, anxiety attacks. Let me tell you that right now there is an enormous amount of funding for studying genetics because it's very quantifiable and because there's new equipment and thus new horizons. Mm -hmm. There is zero um, support for anyone who wants to study how the brain learns from early experience because that's controversial. It could lead someone to feel bad and you would say well you can't experiment on a baby so that creates the perception that it's all genetics but it is not it is so easy to see how we learn from early experience and a very simplistic example and then we could go on to to deeper whatever you want but um if you put a baby with an English family, it learns to speak English. If you put it with a Chinese family, it learns to speak Chinese. Right. And 
And I was personally, I, I went to Africa when I was um, in grad school and I lived next door to an American family who, it was a French speaking African country and um, they were struggling to learn French, the parents, but their seven year old daughter just learned French effortlessly in a few months. Um, so a young brain is very plastic, that's the word for it. And the young brain learns from whatever it experiences and then the neural pathways make that feel normal. Whether that experience is a reward or a threat, that's the chemistry that's released. Gotcha, gotcha. So in your book, you make this connection between like objects triggering bad memories and stirring up negative feelings and emotions like mm. feeling powerless, for example. Is this generally how feelings of anxiety begin for most of us? Uh, yes, exactly. But I'll add one more thing to it, which is called, um, you could call it modeling or yeah. you could call it mirror neurons. So um, I'll just use my own example. I, I'm, uh, I'm a person who could use my own example a lot because I have very few relatives and they're all dead. <laughs> so... So when I was young, my mother was extremely stressed. So I was exposed to a lot of stress. And most people, though, would say that, oh, that their parents, you know, were often. And you know what? People resent it when their parents were stressed. But then they resent it when their parents were sort of calm. It's like, oh, it's so annoying. My parents were always so calm, you That's know. So, <laughs> so the bottom line is that you know, we're all born mammals. Uh -huh. We all have this huge capacity to release huge chemical surges. We all have to learn how to restrain it. When our parents surge, we learn to surge. When uh -huh. our parents are restrained, we learn to restrain. And it's so hard to figure out why we're doing what we're doing. So we each sort of make sense of it like however we can. So in my particular case, and every case is so unique, um, in my particular case, I would see my mother having these rages, and in my particular case, I couldn't figure out what the problem was. Like other people may more identify with their mother, and then they feel threatened by whatever their mother feels threatened by or whatever their father feels threatened by. But in my case, it's like, I have no idea. You know what? My mother told me that the, the predator, the threat was me. You know, she was in a rage because I made her feel that way. Mm. Um, and so first when I'm little, I'm like, Ooh, what did I do to, right. to create this predator? And then I thought, Oh, maybe I can't trust her responses as a good representation of reality. So I withdrew. So how old were you at this time? Approximately. It's hard for me to remember, which is mostly because it's the only reality I ever had. It's not as if something, but I do remember it's not just that I retreated to my room with books because that was like the only reality I knew, but it's then when I got the idea that somehow I was doing something wrong and something unusual. <laughs> um, but um, I tried everything else. You know, I tried to help my mother relieve her anxiety wow. and nothing worked. So I gave up. And that kind of giving up is... Um, socially frowned on and when you so, say you gave up can you expound on that a little get how did you give up emotionally mentally like what did you what yeah caused you to give up? yeah all of them um so and of course it, it wasn't all at once it's like i gradually uh, gave up over the years but first um what i say is um i went in my room and i tried to read books but our house was so small and the walls were so thin that I could hear her screaming. So I had to work hard to block out the noise level. And that actually built my power of concentration. Uh -huh. But I didn't know that. Uh, and I didn't know that everybody else, you know, you don't know how. But um, there were times I tried to, you know, we're told to quote unquote empathize. Right. And when I did that, that's when I felt horrible because like then you're being like 
pulled into like a drowning person is clinging to you. Yes. And oh my God, I, I've hated that feeling. And so going in my room and trying to block my ears out, which of course is not, it has its own downside because you build a, a physical rigidity when you try to block out what's going on. But that was for me better than the alternative. So right. each child decides that based on the other factors going on in their life, what else is available. So in my particular case, I had a father who was actually doing the same thing. He was just like, okay, I'm just going to pretend this is not happening. Oh. And then <laughs> and then I had good teachers who I, I think I actually saw, oh, that's what self-control looks like. Uh -huh. So so the, so those were the other factors that, that helped me see that option. But then I was taught that I was a bad person oh. because you're evil unless you merge with other people's suffering. So right. I could see how many people that would get the idea that you have to merge with other people's suffering in order to be a good person. And that's what's called often the rescue syndrome. That sounds so parallel, like a lot of what you explained to my experience as well. Like I retreated in my room with books. I read every single book that Cahill Gibran wrote. I remember at 16, like I started <laughs> there. Uh, but it was a great way for me to deal with my anxiety because I was so absorbed in something else. And unfortunately, till today, my brain still does that. Like I have to be doing things all the time. There's no, I mean, I do know and benefit from like meditation and I can quiet myself now, but anxiety left me scarred. And I always like to put it that way because a lot of people that suffer with anxiety feel guilty about the feelings that they have, the emotions that they have. And um, even though, thank goodness, my anxiety attacks are at a minimum, um, I feel very scarred from a lot of, you know, what it did to me throughout my life. But, but like constantly being busy is one of the things that people will do to deal with anxiety. And you mentioned that in your book, but in a positive way. Yes. In yes. a positive way, not yes. in a negative way, in a positive way. Can you talk about that? Because yes. one of the reasons I wanted to speak with you, and I'm thrilled to, so thank you again, is because this topic is, I think, not discussed enough, not treated seriously enough by the medical you know, community. The first thing they want to do is load you with medication when you walk in the yep. door. Now, yep. I've told several doctors, do not give me prescriptions for you know Xanax or whatever else they're giving because I tried them and I react very badly to them they don't suit me I become a mess and they just make me feel worse and I knew that right away so I want to be able to help some folks out there that are feeling lost confused they have no place to go nowhere to reach out to maybe they don't like taking medication either and that's one of the reasons I loved your book is because it gives you constructive things to do to try to overcome. And it gives you, like I said before, the knowledge of what's happening to you on a physical level. Yes. So it starts with understanding the job that our brain evolved to do. So if you think about your ancestors in the state of nature, they didn't have a supermarket. They didn't have a refrigerator, so they had to look constantly for food, otherwise they would starve to death. Right. And starving to death was a real threat. And I have to say that my mother grew up without enough food in Brooklyn, and she had that urgent sense of threat. And I think our growing up with abundance is very new in human history, which is why our brain is so um, prioritizing of threat and how easily we learn threat from our ancestors who learned it from their ancestors. Mm. And not just hunger, but um, your village was raided by their village. And yeah. if their village took your food supply, then you would die of hunger. Their, their village may have stolen your daughters, raped your daughters, killed your daughters, whatever. It was a very realistic threat that, that our brain evolved to deal with. So, um, what happens today? 
because we have a more comfortable life and we don't even understand why our this threat system is triggered triggered so easily right we have medicalized this and i don't know how um we've all now grown up with the idea that somehow constant happiness is the norm and something is wrong with us if we're not constantly happy that's and the doctor point. can fix it and like as if the doctor can fix it the way a mechanic can fix a car right that's such a great point people do expect to be happy all the time and and i think too and i wanted to touch on this with you because of social media um suicide rates are, are growing people are more depressed they're more anxious um, what advice do you have for people that are letting social media affect them in such a way that it's increasing their anxiety and politics too? I mean, you see what's going on. Like, what advice do you have for folks? Sure. Um, so first, um, there's sort of like disease of the month club uh, where um, the media is constantly telling you that this is a crisis and that's a crisis mm. because that's like you remember like tune in next week so every time period has had its thing that you blame your sense of crisis on and i would just shut off the media and even like if you just watch happy movies then you still get that unrealistic expectation that everybody else is happy all the time so you have to really understand how your brain works and then just focus on meeting your needs because that's the job your brain evolved to do now you can help others if you want when it meets your needs but it's not like this rescue syndrome where you deny your own um physical impulses to yes. rescue others now the um the underlying source of of our discomfort is that we want to stimulate our happy brain chemicals because that's your brain signal that a need is being met dopamine serotonin oxytocin i explain mm -hmm. these in detail in the book that's your brain signal that says okay now you're safe now your needs are met and that feeling is only released for a few minutes while you're actually doing the behavior that meets your needs. Then the good feeling stops, the chemical is metabolized, and you're back to neutral. When you're back to neutral, you don't have this good feeling masking the potential threat. And the potential threat is always there because we know we're going to die. Excuse me for saying. Oh, and no. So animals, true. animals don't know they're going to die because their brain can't anticipate the future. So we always have this background feeling of, I don't know what's going to kill me. And, you know, in the past, you know, you could have had a cut and a week later you died from infection. You had a cough and a week later you died from typhoid. Um, today, you know, you have nothing and you go in for a checkup and they tell you that you're going to die in 10 years because yeah. of an x-ray or something, mm -hmm. you know? So on the one hand, we're safer, but we feel less safe. So that's why we want to constantly activate our happy chemicals to um, mask the threatened feeling. But then the happy chemical only lasts for a short time. Right. So we have this treadmill feeling that we want more and more. And we feel like if we don't stimulate it all the time, then we're going to have this urgent threat. But if we do stimulate it all the time, then you're going to have one bad habit or another. And that's going to give you a different set of uh, set, right. sets like a of threat. addiction or whatever, because you're a constantly looking for that happy yes. chemical, right? Yes. You know, that's that that's one of the things that like was such an eye opener when I was reading your book, because even though like you may know these things, but you put them together so perfectly and they made so much sense. Um, and, and that reminds me too. like, look at the pharmaceutical commercials yeah that we're having to be subjected to yes we're constantly being told yes. about new drugs for yes. new diseases and then you start thinking well maybe i have this disease or my doctor yes. even told me that yes he said they're the worst thing because all his patients go to him and say oh no i have this 
you have to give me this medication. Yes. yes. So, That's so it's it. hurting everybody, That's but yet That's it. two countries globally are only allowed to do those types of commercials. Yes. And I believe they're New Zealand and America, all the other countries throughout the globe ban them. So why are we still allowing this to take place to, to make us feel more anxious and, and scared all the time? Yeah. yeah. You know, all I can say is go live in another country and every country you could be in is going to have something that's going to, you're going to say, oh my God, this is crazy. That's How could they do this? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I shared your view when I was young and I was like, oh my God, this country is so terrible. And I was effectively repeating what my professors had said. And right. I have to admit that I was a professor for 25 years and I repeated that to my students. But the more I lived in other countries, the more I saw like, you know, every country has, you know, this this, this absolute mammalian insanity that we have it leaks right. out one way or another <laughs> right that's so true that's so true but that just always gets under my skin oh, I guess as a person who suffers from anxiety yes. um you know to to be exposed yes. to those types of things just like yes. really get me <laughs> they're not yes. good <laughs> I absolutely agree and the first thing I was going to say is put on the mute when those um I but, that's what I do but then <laughs> I thought no, you know what? You're better off listening to them because when they go through that whole list of possible side effects, that's what you need to listen to. Really? Um, yes, because, so here's the thing. I used to be, um, so, so um, I used to be very careful about speaking out against meds because um, it's an individual decision yes. and you're, allegedly you can't say anything about it unless you have a medical license. But people with a medical license, they must be pro-meds or else they lose their license. So there's no objectivity at all to the discussion. Now, I've had readers contact me who report exactly what you're saying. So I want for your listeners to understand. Okay, so the first step is what Carol Ann had, which is I took them and I had a bad effect, so I said, whoa, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. So the second bad problem that can happen is you take them and they work for a while, and then your brain habituates and they don't work anymore, so you go back to the doctor and they up your dose. The next bad thing that can happen is they work for you, but you also have side effects. So you go back yeah. to the doctor and they add another medication. Then over time, you're taking this and this and this, and your side effects increase and increase. And people get so fried that they decide they want to go off them. And they go off them overnight because they're so upset, and then they get much worse side effects. Right. So then they go, maybe they do a slow taper, which is advised, but then they have this bad experience slowly for a long time. And many of them have, it's a really long time before they could get past the symptoms. And I'm reluctant to speak about this because again, I don't want to suggest to people another thing to right. worry about right. and more bad symptoms. But it's a reality. It's, well, it's a reality. We don't 100 percent know because the people with these bad symptoms also had bad symptoms before they started this whole thing. So that's why the bottom line is to just go back to the state of nature and say, what is natural? And what is natural is, to use your words, is being busy. <laughs> because that's, our ancestors had to be busy or they would starve to death. They would freeze in the winter. Their babies would cry. And then as soon as they fed them, they had another baby. So, so that was their way of being busy all the time. Yes. So, but why is it that busyness um, works? It, like how how does it work and what is it good is it bad like in, in a way good. i i see some negative negative like consequences yes. of being busy yeah. all the time yes. because even when i'm relaxing I'm, I'm like i grab my phone and i'm reading and then i say this isn't good like i'm like it's a fight it's a mental mm. fight mm -hmm. when is being busy enough and then you know when do you have to learn to end being busy and just relax I know what you're saying. Um, one way of thinking of it is that when you're 
doing a lot of one activity that you can shift to another activity mm-hmm. and an activity that requires less focus and a little more relaxation, but you're still having an activity. So the idea that activity is bad for you, that comes from a certain philosophy, and I don't want to offend people of any particular philosophy, but that's being very much taught to us these days, that um, you shouldn't you shouldn't be so busy. Um, and I think a lot of the people with that view end up depressed. And (laughs) I'll tell you how I got to this. So I did yoga for 10 years and I went to a yoga studio that was very um, assertive about teaching Buddhism. It was like going to mass, like Mm. you kept hearing um, Buddhism during the yoga. And my yoga teacher was one of the most stressed people I ever knew. And she was constantly talking about her stress. And after 10 years, I thought, I can't stand listening to her anymore. She's constantly, like it hasn't worked for her. (laughs) That's odd that she would emphasize that. Yes. Well, I think that's the culture that in, in a certain, it's a certain subculture where people blame their stress on modern society. And then they're constantly looking for ways to feel good but they're always blaming their stress on society and then they're just thinking that the solution is like to oppose society and to do nothing so now that gets us you keep asking me so what else can we do so let's talk about that okay so one way i answer it in the book is with like a list of activities that i i call it fill your pantry with anxiety tamers stock your pantry with anxiety tamers and i make an analogy with um if you don't want to eat junk food you have to stock your pantry with healthy food Uh but on a deeper level what what the activities you want are something that stimulates your dopamine something that stimulates your serotonin something that stimulates your oxytocin So first you have to understand what stimulates dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. Then you have to understand what am I already doing to stimulate them? And how am I driving myself crazy by feeling like I have to do that dopamine activity or that serotonin activity or that oxytocin activity or else something terrible is going to happen. And to say, oh, so that good feeling can be stimulated in other ways and I can design another way to stimulate it, but my brain will automatically go to the old way until I build a new pathway, right. and it takes a lot of repetition to build a new pathway. So that's that's one question I want to ask you, a way that we could rewire our, I have a dog, so if you hear him, <laughs> he always gets mad when he's more than three feet away from me. <laughs> um, so, so one of the other ways that we can rewire ourselves is by building these new pathways and that's via repetition right so if you're doing something over and over and over again we'll then build these pathways that'll make us feel better am i right yes but it's complicated because um when you first do the activity you don't expect it to feel good because when it's new, it doesn't feel good. So then you would think, well, why would I repeat this if it doesn't feel good? Okay. So that's why it's complicated. So I'll give you a simple example. Um, Well, I could use an example of a person that is longing to have a drink for alcohol. Let's just say longing to go meet their friends at a bar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you think about meeting your friends at a bar, it stimulates your dopamine because you expect a reward. Mm -hmm. It may stimulate oxytocin because this is the way that you get a feeling of social support. And it may even stimulate your serotonin. Serotonin is what I call the one-up feeling, the feeling of importance. And you may get that because something in your past associated um, alcohol with feeling important. Mm. And that's different for each person, but if 
Whatever your habit is, you could think about how did that stimulate a feeling of importance in your past? So in that moment, you think to yourself, oh, if I meet my friends at the bar, it's going to feel good in the short run, but it's going to feel something bad's going to happen in the long run. So what else can I do? So then you try to think of something else, but nothing else is going to sound good compared to that because that's a circuit you've already built. So what you need to do, and I call this dig the well before you need the water. So oh. you plan, what am I going to do in that moment when I feel crappy and I'm longing for my old habit? So let me think of a new habit that stimulates my dopamine, a new habit that stimulates my oxytocin and my serotonin, and then... I'm going to start doing that when I'm in a good mood so that when I'm having a bad time, ah. it'll be more easy to flow into that. Gotcha. Okay. I love that. I love yeah. that. That's great. So, that sounds like a really positive thing that a person can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, just, so what can a person do? So for example, you could say, I've always learned, wanted to learn how to cook one of those um, eight hour pulled pork recipes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I say that because planning stimulates dopamine, the expectation of a reward, right. the smell, and then whoever you share the pulled pork with, um, stimulates oxytocin and your pride in your accomplishment stimulates serotonin. Now, you may say, oh, well, you know, I can't just sit around eating greasy pork all day. Well, that's true for the most part, although it depends on what other habit you're trying to get rid of. So if you're trying to get rid of a really bad habit, then maybe, you know, this is this is better for you. But um, if you're um, trying to lose weight, then you might plan a different habit. Right, and right. one thing I recommend in the book is some habit that uses your mind and your body together because that keeps you um, more focused. Yes. It keeps your mind so busy that you can't obsess over the other thing. So a cooking is an example. But another example would be um, what I talk about is um, many people say I'm going to go for a walk. But going for a walk doesn't keep your mind busy, you know. And, you know, knitting, I don't know, you could knit while you watch a movie. <laughs> so. Right. Um, what I tell people, what I want to do is I, I listen to comedy while I'm walking up and down stairs. If I'm, if I'm stuck in a public place and I'm having a bad feeling and I have that comedy already loaded on my phone and like if I'm in a meeting and it's really annoying that I always have this thing I can do with me. And if I'm at home, I love to watch a foreign language video while yeah, I'm that in your book. stretching and, and, and right. moving um, and exercising, not exercising in a repetitive way where I'm counting anything. But um, I have found that when I watch a foreign language video, it's so hard to, con it's so hard to figure out that it completely 100% absorbs my mind and that relieves the circuit. You see, when you're activating a stress circuit, it takes a while for the circuit to calm down. Mm. So when you do something else that's completely absorbing, then your energy goes somewhere else and then your body metabolizes the cortisol. Because while the cortisol is in you, everything looks bad. So while the cortisol is in you, everything you could think of, you say, that doesn't sound like fun. That wow. doesn't sound like a good solution. That looks stupid. Everybody hates me, right? So like people that are having a panic attack at that moment, they don't want to do anything but get, you know, immediate relief. Uh, they're, you know, they're not going to be open to like doing a task that you know might help them. They just want, that's why a lot of them do turn to medication because they want that immediate relief. And a lot of people that I talk to that suffer from anxiety want that. They just Let me give want... you a great example. Yeah. If you were um, a gazelle and you were being chased by a lion and someone tells you, imagine yourself on a tropical beach and you think, I don't want to lie on a tropical beach. A lion's going to eat me. Right. right, right. <laughs> so, so that's it. So they're feeling like there's an urgent threat. And your brain is designed to say, where is the threat? Where is the threat? And 
So what I recommend in my book is the way your brain is designed to work. What does a gazelle do when it feels like a lion is chasing it? First, it looks around to see where the lion is so it knows which direction to run. Then it looks for an escape path and then it focuses on its next step. So you don't want to, if the gazelle just stared at the lion, it would die. So it's focusing on your next step. And that's the thing. So what does your next step mean is the expectation of meeting your needs. So you could say that panic is sort of the feeling of, I'm never going to be able to meet my needs. I'm just going to die. Um, but the more you could say, okay, I'm going to engage in an activity that meets my needs. That's what makes the gazelle feel like, okay, I'm going to escape from this. Um, lion and go back to eating grass. Go ahead. Many people like they just obsess over the lion. For example, if the lion is, you know, your boss, your um, your friend who's on your nerves, your coworker, your spouse, and then you just focus and perceive that you can't do anything for yourself because of that person. That whole blame habit just leaves you feeling powerless yes. and we're all born powerless so we all have a powerless circuit so it's the power circuit that we need to build from lived experience by taking one step after another that's an excellent point what advice do you have because some folks when they're in the middle of a panic attack it it feels so horrible and in that moment i had a friend call 911 several times because she was convinced that she was having a heart attack. I mean, I felt that too, but I knew, I knew like consciously that I wasn't and I knew what to do to get out of it. But this girl doesn't know what to do. So she calls 911 and she's convinced that she's dying. Um, what can you tell people? Um, I mean, obviously you can't say, oh, no, you're going to be fine because it's a medical situation and maybe that person really can have a heart attack. But for most people, like, what can you do to ease their anxiety when they're in the midst of a panic attack, thinking that they're going to die, they have to go to the hospital? Good, good. Okay. And, and here's a, a way to even add to that situation. Let's say that your friend has another panic attack and she thinks, oh, I better not call 911 because they're going to tell me, blah, blah, blah. And but they then have. Maybe, it, maybe it really is a heart attack this time. Right. But right. if I call them, they'll laugh at me. But if I don't call them, I'll die. But if I call them, I'll la they'll laugh at me. And that's almost as bad as dying. Yep. And so that's their thought loop. And they're not thinking of any other alternatives. So the idea of what other response would you like to have in that moment? So what would the other response be is to say, I can... That first to say, my threat circuit was triggered in some way. I can figure out what triggered my threat circuit. And then I could um, give myself time to relax by doing something fun. And then I can take a step toward meeting my needs. But first, uh, and, and this is what my book is about. But first, the person you're mentioning, if they feel that it's more urgent, there are alternative practitioners that can help that like, other than just a, a medical doctor can just throw pills at it. Right. And um, I think you mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a good one. And another one is um, there are practitioners who do biofeedback. And, I was going to bring that up because yay. I did go to biofeedback. Yeah. And when, when I, I think I was about 19, and I had read about biofeedback and I decided to go because the anxiety was that bad. And it, it was, tr it was life changing. For yes. me. It really was. Yeah. It, it allowed me to really get in touch with my physiology, like what was going on yes. when I was having an anxiety attack and what to, that's the only reason I can get out of them. So if yes. I'm having a panic attack, I know what to do to get out of it now, thanks to biofeedback. So I'm Great. so glad you mentioned that. Right. But um, can I ask you, have you, and then the next step is, how have, have you ever figured out what triggers them? My panic attacks? That's the thing because, and I wanted to ask you this, because 
you can be in the middle of doing something you love, like watching a movie, reading a book, eating a great meal, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you'll get a panic attack. So those types of moments are very confusing for us people that suffer from anxiety because you're like, well, I was doing something I love. Like, why did yes. I have a panic attack yes. from nowhere? Yes. Maybe yes. you can talk about that. It, it's very challenging, and I totally agree that um, it can happen when it, it, I have this too. Um, I, I don't have panic attacks, but I have muscle tension, mm -hmm. and I have it more when I relax. Um, so there's a few things, but um, I've learned there's a guy called Dr. Sarno. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, he talks about people with chronic pain and um, he's no longer with us, but his work is starting to get very popular. And he said, um, nice people have these problems because they always want to be nice. And so <laughs> um, if, if everyone has a part of them that's not nice because it's natural that when something bad happens to you, you're like, you know, stay away from me. Sure. Um, and that sort of anger response is natural and healthy. And when you when you cut it off, then you can't um, you can't release it. It gets withheld. And so I, I feel putting these two together that when you're busy, your mind is focused on something else. But when you relax, all of your negative, uh, like your bad feelings can bubble up closer to yes, the surface exactly that's exactly what happens too and this happens unconsciously so yeah. we're not even aware that this yeah. is happening to us and that's such a great point because um the girl that i was talking about that's one of the things like she'll be in the throes of work doing something she loves and all of a sudden get these massive panic attacks where she has to call 911 and and sadly the the paramedics know her and they're starting to have, like they say negative things to her that like you said before, loop back to, oh my God, I can't call because they're starting to say, you know, bad things to me. And it, it's really a, it, it's a terrible condition that, um, like I said before, is, is not discussed enough. Yet, oddly, depression is being talked about a lot. Now, do you see connections in your line of work between the two anxiety and depression uh, or are they completely separate so if you have one you can't like have the other i know you could have both but what are yeah, your yeah, thoughts yeah. on that um first i want to say that i'm i'm not a clinician and i'm not credentialed as a clinician and i do not see patients um i was a professor of management and i went on to do my own study of evolutionary psychology and to study the animal brain. So I'm always going back to what is the animal brain designed to do? So depression versus anxiety. So would a, de a depressed animals don't survive. Uh, anxiety, you know, panic attack animals don't survive. Do so, animals get depressed though? Is there so, such a thing as depression in animals? So here's the thing, when you watch this sort of the Disney movies, um, uh, there, uh, you have to distinguish between a wild animal that's surviving on its own mm -hmm. versus an animal who's surviving because somebody's bringing it its food every day, which is completely nothing like the state of nature <laughs> and mm -hmm. is a completely not representative of how the brain evolved to work. So, um, in, in a state of nature, if you got depressed, you would just die those genes would be weeded out and the genes uh -huh. we've inherited are for those who survived. How did they survive? By constantly doing something, you know, by, by, but your brain only gives you the good feelings if you do something. So you learn, oh, I got to do something to feel good. <laughs> okay. Now, um, what about anxiety? Well, um, I know first I'll just say it because I a lot of your listeners probably know about this. There's this book called Shaking the Tiger that I'm sorry, Waking the Tiger that everybody talks about, which is that when an animal has a uh, a severe threat, 
-hmm. then it shakes and the shaking releases that. But I think that's only a small part of the story. Um, so if an animal had a panic attack, so here's interesting thing. When a gazelle has a lion that's so close that it has no chance of running away, mm -hmm. the gazelle um, freezes and it falls over and the lion thinks it's dead. Uh. And the lion goes back to get its pals to come and share the meal. And when that happens, the gazelle just gets up and runs away. Brilliant. But, <laughs> yes, but the gazelle doesn't consciously do that. The gazelle does it because with the lion that close, it has so much cortisol that it just freezes. And that shuts down its metabolism. And its metabolism is so slow that the lion can't even tell it's alive. Amazing. Yeah. Now that's a little different from us because our eggs are when you have anxiety, your 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 um, metabolism is often speeded up, which right. is the thing of running. So you evolve to run when there's a threat. So it's all around learning to teach yourself that that sense of threat is learned. So we're designed to learn about threat. So for example, when a baby touches a hot stove, then that pain builds a neural pathway so that the next time the baby goes near the stove, sure. they don't want to touch it. So we're designed to, for your brain to warn you when you get close to anything that hurt you before. Okay? Amazing. So that's what we're always doing. <clears throat> But so I have so many question. Can't if, always admit it to yourself. Okay. Yes. Right. If if you're in the middle of an anxiety attack and you started doing jumping jacks, exercise. Like if you you if you know, oh my gosh, I'm having a panic attack. Mm -hmm. I have to go do something to you know get rid of that cortisol. And you started breaking out in exercise or running or whatever. Mm -hmm. Is that something that would work all the time? Like. Well, so here's a couple of things. One is um, if a person has a really elevated heart rate, I'm not saying they should run um, because, you know, that, that could be too much. But right. there are many people who run because they feel it has a preventive effect, that um, it dissipates their cortisol before they get to the point of a, of, of a panic attack. However, yeah, yeah but I think a variety of physical activity is better than just running or jumping jacks. Because although like if a person thinks jumping jacks and it works great, do it. But um, if you find a fun form of physical activity, it's, it's, you're more likely to do it and you're more likely to do it sooner. So when I say fun, like I said, I use, if I um, am, uh, watching something fun while I'm exercising. Mm -hmm. So for a person who doesn't like to run and then they say, I'm having a panic attack, I don't feel like running, you know? Um, but yeah, they, uh, you know, your friend who's at her desk. And you know what, this is the thing, many people will get up and go to the refrigerator mm. and it's not the food, it's the getting up and going to the refrigerator. The distraction. So. Yes. And so that's why I'll get up when I find myself at the refrigerator and I say, oh, it's not hunger, it's that I need circulation. So I'm going to get water and then I'll find other ways to, to move. So paying attention to these things um, that we're doing with our bodies, these little, mm -hmm. you know, cues are very important, right? Yeah. Like, yeah preventing anxiety or dealing, coping yes. with anxiety. Yes, yes. See, but that's also, a good point. But on a deeper level, if a person can understand what triggers it, that would help to relieve it earlier. So let, let me give you a hypothetical example. Let's say your friend is sitting at her desk and you said she's working on some, something she loves, mm -hmm. but maybe she gets a bad feeling about something. And a typical example would be, I love this project, but I bet after I do it that so-and-so is going to criticize it. And you have a 
huge reaction to the idea that so-and-so is going to criticize it because when you were a child, you worked really hard on something in anticipation of a reward, and instead of getting a reward, you either got ignored or sneered at. And for a child, that's a huge threat because children are so dependent. And if that happened to you repeatedly, that built a pathway that says, everything's going to go to shit, <laughs> you yeah. know? So exactly. you have that competing in your brain. It's like, I really love this project, but everything's going to go to shit. Right. But I really love this project, but everything's going to go to shit. That's so such that, a common thing. Yes. So you have feel. to start by admitting to yourself that you're having this thought that everything's going to go to shit and then look for why am I thinking that? So your first response is going to be because this person is such a jerk. And yeah. with all that cortisol, you're going to find all that evidence that that person is a jerk. But when you learn to understand your brain, you say, what experience did I have in the past that would have been similar, that would have created this circuit? Um, and uh, I'll just give you very simplest example. So when I was a kid, I got my mother this very special birthday present and I was very proud of myself and my mother often sulked that she didn't get her birthday celebrated. Mm. And I gave her this birthday present and she just criticized it. And so oh. that, in a very sniveling way, and so I have this deep circuit of like, oh, I'm going to work really hard on something and then it's just going to get rejected and dismissed and nobody's ever going to give me any respect. So I had to learn that that was a circuit and then to say, well, what other circuit can I have? And the way I built my other circuit, I, I, li I like to listen to books when I'm driving. I listen to a lot of biographies and I learned that most people that we would hear of today, they didn't get appreciated while they were alive. They didn't get respect until after they died. And I say to myself, gee, if they only knew how much love they were getting in the future. So I thought, well, why don't I visualize myself getting love in the future? And, and, you know, oh, instead I like of, that. Instead of visualizing myself getting sneered at, I could visualize myself getting appreciation without and resentment. These little tasks help build these neural pathways, yes, right? Yes, yes. And it's never too late. In, yes. in like age to do them, whether you're 80 or 12, it's never like you, you, in other words, if the older you get, it still works just as good, this little task. Not just as good. So here's the complication and I explain in the book. So when you're young, your brain has a lot of what's called myelin, which you could think of as like paving on your neural highways. And so you could think that your interstate highway system is built by the time you're 20. Mm -hmm. After that, you can build new trails, like just a little dirt trail. And you will always have the old highways. You will always be tempted by the old highways. But as an adult, you have the maturity to say, I'm going to dig a new trail and I'm going to use it because it goes where I want to go, where the highway doesn't. I love that analogy. That's great. Thank you. That's really good. Well, I'll give you the whole analogy. So... So the way I say is your brain is like a jungle of neurons. And if you imagine yourself in the jungle and you either have a paved road or you have to slash a new trail and you get out your machete and every step you take is so much work and then you hardly get anywhere. And then the next day the trail has grown over again and you got to do all that work again. Yes. But if you slash the same trail every day, then you have a path. And if you take that path, it goes to a beautiful forest. Whereas if you take the highway, it goes to a dumpy city. Love it. <laughs> Analogies are always great. They're, they're very visualizing, so yeah. they always work. <laughs> so what, el what other key points in your book? Um, I, I, I really encourage anyone that suffers from anxiety or has a loved one that suffers from anxiety needs to read your book. I plan on rereading it because it's so packed with information that like the first time you read it, you, you kind of just get the crux of it and you really need to dig your heels back in and read it again 
to understand so much of what what goes yeah. on because it really is enlightening to know what your body is doing in, in the middle of a, a panic attack why we have them you know mm. and and your analogies in the book are great with animals and gazelles and i love mm. all that connection um what other key points in your book do you uh would you like to make right now um sure. to, to like Okay. Say, hey, you guys sure. need to read this book. Yeah. This and help. also, I when when you say about reading it twice, what I think is the first time you read it, you probably think, oh, I know someone who needs to hear this, and I know yes. someone. Who needs... And then the second time you read it for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so, oddly, though, I did the opposite. The oh, first good. time, and maybe because I suffer from anxiety, but the first time I, well, I didn't read it again for the second time, but as I was reading it, I was like identifying and trying to understand, like I kept pausing and thinking about things and relating it to me. So the second time I read it, maybe I'll have a different perspective yeah, and think, well, maybe I should tell my friend this or. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's very good that you're able to, a lot of people don't like to think about their own circuits. They only like to right. think of it. Yeah. So anyway, what, what's one more thing? So the one more thing, what I talk about in the book of one of the pitfalls I mention is social comparison of comparing oh yourself to others. Now, social comparison is an absolutely natural and normal um, function of the mammal brain. Because if you've ever watched nature videos, you see that mammals have status hierarchies, as uncomfortable as that concept makes us feel. And the mammal brain evolved to constantly compare itself to others to see where it stands as either strength or weakness. And in, in the human world, this, this might be called ego or pride or confidence. We have good words for it and bad words for it, depending on whether it's in someone else or you, you know, but there's a natural urge to feel special because that promotes survival. Right. And so when you compare yourself to others, you notice that there are some strengths and some weaknesses. And, and I use the example that when I, I have this friend and when I look at her, I see everything she has all the things she has that I don't have. Mm -hmm. And when she looks at me, she's all, she sees all the things I have that she doesn't have. So we're alert for our own weaknesses because that's a survival threat in the state of nature. And if you focused on your own strengths, you would feel less threatened. But when you focus on your strengths, then you think you're a bad person because there's all this indoctrination that you're not supposed to put yourself above others. So the bottom line I always say is you can put yourself up without putting others down. And you need to do that because if you keep putting yourself down, you're going to convince yourself that they're putting you down. And you have to know that you're putting yourself down and you have the power to stop doing that. So it's more comfortable to project that to other people than than to own up to it in other words like if you put yourself up it's easier to say well you know i'm going to put myself down because it feels more comfortable or it's morally more comfortable i don't know or it's, it's a habit you put yourself right, down habit. because it's a habit so it's a habit that you learn from past experience either because you were rewarded for putting yourself down you relieved threat by putting yourself down and um, you were you modeled other people who put themselves down. Um, you know, and so it's so interesting to again look back at nature and animals and understand that all of these things we're feeling are built into us. That's that's another reason why I love your book. It's because it it, it kind of relieves you in a way. Um, to think, well, this isn't all my fault. This is nature's fault. Mm -hmm. So again, you're blaming, you know, you're kind of like blaming nature, but it's true. You know, we're biologically designed yep. this way. Yes. And it's so important to, to know that, I think, too. I think it makes dealing with your anxiety easier to know where it comes from, why it comes from, the things in nature that it does. Yeah. And as far as comparison goes, Again, going back to social media, I think that's one of the big things that like Facebook does 
you know, you're looking at other people having a good time. You're looking at other people looking better than you. And a lot of people are getting very anxious and they're closing their Facebook accounts too, because I have several friends that just won't go on Facebook anymore because it's depressing them to do that because they're constantly comparing their lives to other people. Well, it's all about what else are they doing without Facebook? Hopefully they're, they're taking actual steps to connect to the world. Um, I hope they are doing that. And that's a great point because I think too, when you close Facebook, you're just not dealing with the problem and you're just, you know, it's like an avoidance kind of thing too. So it's easier just to not deal with it. So anyway, in one word, self-acceptance. Yes. Great. Love that. Love that. So um, you gave us so much great advice today and I love the conversation being open because there are so many people that, how many people do you know the numbers that suffer just in the United States from anxiety? Like I know they're growing. I did read they're growing. I, I'm not, I, I'm statistics. not a believer in this disease mentality because I, I, it's not useful to normalize anxiety or right. to say we're having a mental health crisis. I, I think that's very unhealthy. Who is trying to weaken our country by persuading us that we're all dysfunctional? I don't think that's healthy. Why do you think it's in the news so prevalently now? Like, why are they saying, oh, anxiety, you know, the numbers are growing and depression and suicide. Like, I see that all the time and read yeah. articles all the time. Now more than ever that they're trying to normalize, like you say, why do you think that is, that they're doing that? Let's just say that in the mammal world, you bond when there's a common enemy. Ah, um, yeah. So that's a great point. Yes. So when there's no common enemy, you just wander off to greener pasture because that's how you meet your needs. So if you want to have control over people, you scare them about a common enemy and then they stick together. And there's infinite number of possible common enemies. And yes. people have done this all through human history. That is such an excellent point. And the awareness of that alone is, is brilliant. Just to be aware that, you know, why are we reading so much about this? And to make that connection is, is great. Thank and instead so of blaming much. them, I don't miss instead of blaming them for creating this mentality, it's saying, I am sucking into this belief in a common enemy because mm. it makes me feel good. Um, because it makes me feel like I'm part of the club and it makes me feel like I'm significant because I know the truth. And that is the subject of my other book, The Science of Positivity. One, I have a few other books and one of them is called The Science of Positivity, um, Stop Negative Thought Patterns by Changing Your Brain Chemistry. And I did book. see that on your Amazon list there. I'm gonna have to just scoop that one up for sure and read that. I'll now. send it to you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate the conversation today. I know so many people are going to benefit by it. And I really encourage anybody that's listening to read this book. It's it's really changed my perspective on anxiety. And I think that reading it again is going to be great because I'm going to take notes next time. I'm going to sit down and take a lot of notes. So the first time you read it, like I said, you need to just take it all in. And then when you go back, you can do things like take notes and make key pointers. But I think it's definitely going to be changing my perspective on how I look at anxiety. Thank you so much, doctor. I greatly appreciate it, Loretta. It was a great time having you. And if my readers have any questions, would, would you mind, um, you know, if they reach out, you know, I'll create sure. an article sure. and put the video and they'll be asking some questions. So I would appreciate it if uh, great. you could take a few minutes and answer them. Thank Ooh. you so much, doctor. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.